Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another photo mishmash. This one being broadcast live June 16th, 2021. I am so excited to welcome back to the show, Steve and Tanya. I'll talk to them in just a minute, but we've got a lot of stuff to talk about. More information about the Nikon retro camera. Tanya is a Nikon shooter. Steve loves retro. I'm really excited to get their opinion about it, but Mm -hmm. The information I have, I think, is going to be mostly disappointing. So we'll be sharing that. Plus, we need to talk about the Canon R3 briefly. I, I feel like it is to such a small percentage of our audience that are going to be interested in this Canon camera. But I want to talk about it briefly. I got to talk about why I have the floaties back, back on the desk and what I was super gluing earlier today. I have done another video on this channel other than Mishmash in the last month. So that's new. And that was uh, kind of a preview hands-on with the 150 to 500 from Tamron, which will be headed out on a trip with me very shortly. That's mildly related to the floaties. I was also kind of judging. Steve was commenting that I'm a little red in the floaties. I don't know. Do I match or? You match. I don't know. We got all of that, plus your images to review. Chat room, we're going to be chatting with you. As always, if you've got questions, put them in the chat room. We'll be answering as we go. But as I said, I'm very excited to welcome back to the show my good friend, Tanya and Steve. Tanya, we'll start with you. How are you doing? I'm okay. I had a photo shoot today that I scheduled last night, which is really unusual. Um, but it was crazy, which just means that I'm marketing to my kind. And... Um, <laughs> And it'll be interesting. Like, essentially, I came and they had set up a tea party. I think I got invited to photograph a family playing dress up. I'm okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> so they were like, we've got to have a tea party theme. And I was like, let me just make this look crazier. <laughs> now, they weren't, uh, they were in tea party attire, right? They were like, you didn't show up and they were in plushies or something. No, they were in tea party attire. It's, okay. I think it's going to be fabulous. But um, it was, it was just really, everything about this was unusual, uh, just even getting hired the night before, and it was a long distance for me, but um, it, was, it was a fun time. They were good clients. Nice, nice. Were there a lot of pinkies out with teacups or pinkies in? I don't know what the, what <laughs> um, the proper I'll is. I'll have to relook at the picture. If, okay. if there were no pinkies out, then I messed up in posing. <laughs> <laughs> That's that, that's something to, to think about, right? You know, you, you're posing family pictures. If teacups are involved, I guess you need to be thinking about pinkies as well. Yeah. Yeah. Tanya, of course, can be followed at tanyawilhelm.artist. That is her Instagram where you can find links to your portrait work. So hopefully we'll be able to see some of these teacup pictures on that Instagram down the road. Also, your fantastic macro work as well. You are a professional photographer in the uh, eastern Pennsylvania region. Yes. And, and now um, Steve. Just, oh, go ahead, Tanya. Actually, I just posted more cicada shots on my macro, and I'm very busy with portrait work. So right now, the best place to find me is probably on my portrait site. Okay. I, I need to go look at your um, cicada macro pictures because a friend of mine who just moved from the East Coast to the West Coast is complaining that he hasn't seen any epic cicada pictures yet, and he's disappointed. So um, I need to point him in your direction, and I'll do that after the show. I hope I make a grade. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I think so. Your macro work is awesome. <laughs> and then sitting between Tanya and I is Steve, who I haven't seen in a whole, uh, I don't know, 20 hours or something like that. I was going to say, I don't know if it's even been 24 hours. I, yeah, I guess it probably has. But uh, yeah. Yeah. hey, everybody, it's great to be back here. It's nice to be in a uh, nice air conditioned room with, um, I don't know, 75 degree temperatures outside after what Toby and I have been through the past few days. Uh, record yeah. heat in Joshua Tree uh, for this time of year. And I mean, we were, I would say, a solid 110 on the, the hottest point of the day, wow. maybe higher. I mean, they were supposedly breaking records and they were talking about heat up to 120. It felt like 182, but uh, great to be with you all. And I, yeah, nothing, nothing too interesting in terms of tea parties. I mean, I did have four or five nights of rooming with Toby on a tour, so that's always an adventure. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, 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 was, I, wait, I was waiting for the tea party connection, but you're just going to say adventure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And, and I would consider a move to uh, the West Coast mm -hmm. from the East Coast 
because of the cicada. So I am not out on the interwebs searching for a great cicada picture, but I am, I am as a friend, very happy that Tanya is finally getting some pictures of cicadas because I've been telling her every single week, like just come down to my house and <laughs> literally we'll have millions of them to photograph. All right, well, I'll bring the tea party because <laughs> I grew up having tea parties and my mom has like a thousand teacups. So. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> all in, all at once. There you go. A tea party with uh, cicada appetizers. Perfect. There you go. What could you want? Oof. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we're, we're going to lose audience here. Numbers are going to go down. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so Joshua Tree was great. It was very hot during the day. Luckily, this was mostly an astrophotography focused tour. So we really didn't venture out before, what, 6 p.m. Um, and by sunset or just after sunset in the park at that higher elevation, it was always really, really nice. It was. Uh, but during the day, going and getting lunch or just Oh, geez, I don't know how people live there. And, you know, I know some uh, chat room, you're commenting, sharing um, kind of weather where you've been. Uh, Sue is in chat. She's in Las Vegas, way over 100 today. Uh, then we got Tom Boggs down there in Oceanside. Lovely, lovely summer, 75. So, um, yeah, here here in, in um, Seattle, it is a gorgeous day. It's mid-70s, beautiful blue skies, and uh, quite nice. And cicada-free. So I feel like I got the best of all the worlds. <laughs> Not they should be gone soon, though, right? Shouldn't they be finished? What's that? I said they should be gone soon. I feel like Steve has had them for a long time. Yeah, it has been a long time. They're starting to die. Uh, of course, we've had exoskeletons, you know, all over the yard for weeks now, and those are starting to decompose. But uh, the the big ones, you know, once they've hot hatched from that, those are starting to kind of. You see dead ones out there all over the place. And it's just, whew, it's been a mess. <laughs> it's I'm out there with the blower cleaning the yard like every other day, man. <laughs> it's gross. It's It sounds pretty gross. It sounds pretty <laughs> gross. Uh, I also want to thank Roy. Roy's in the chat, um, and he is collecting questions. So as I said, if you've got questions as we go through the show, feel free to drop them into the comments. Also, um, we have a hard out on the show. We do need to be wrapped up in by uh, what 3.15 start time, uh, Pacific Daylight time. So we're going to get going here in just a minute. We're going to start looking at your images. We've got some gorgeous images. If you're watching the show and you're not a pen member, you should consider becoming a pen member. Uh, just $24 for your first year. You get access to all of our training videos, weekly articles, uh, and of course, access to all of the past content that's up there, which is now hundreds and hundreds of articles, as well as you get access to a fantastic community of people. Many of them are in the chat. And as I said before, one of the things that I think makes this community one of the best on the internet, if not the best, is the fact that people interact with each other online the same as if they would if we were having a face-to-face -face conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, if Steve said, hey, I'm really thinking about that new Sony camera, I wouldn't go, you idiot, that's the stupidest camera you could buy, which is what it seems like people online do sometimes. They do. Oh, that's uh, part for the course online in most comment sections. Yeah. So um, we're not like that. We uh, and the community is not like that. So I, I'd say give it a try. Come join us. You get to submit images for this plus the bi-monthly contest um, and also just put up in the Facebook group or on the community forum anytime you want for feedback. And I love seeing everybody jump in and give all kinds of uh, relevant and helpful feedback. Yeah. Uh, so real quick, I you know, if you're interested, I've got a video about this lens. Uh, it's going with me uh, later this week to Alaska to photograph brown bears. Uh, it is, um, uh, my 100 to 400 is out of reach, but it's a very nice lens for the money. It's about half the cost of Sony's 100 to 400, and it does 150 to 500. So you get a little bit more reach. Uh, it has those nice features like the Arca Swiss compatible built in. And I haven't, I haven't seen this before in a lens. I'm sure there's some others out there, but it has this clutch lock system. So if you want to lock it at 300, you just move the zoom ring a millimeter, a centimeter forward, and it's now locked at that point. You want to unlock it. It's just a slight tug backwards. It also has a lock switch, but I really prefer this clutch mechanism because your hand is already here 
when you're using the zoom ring. So it's nice to keep it there to lock it or unlock it in the position that you want. I think that's a smart and uh, important touch. No, that's nice. I, my, uh, my Canon, and I don't know if your son yeah. has this, it probably does. It's a tension ring. So yeah, you know, like uh, you, you zoom out. And what's nice about that is you can adjust the tension. But there's been a bunch of times where it's been kind of loose. And then I'll, yeah. I'll put the lens down or I'll hold it down by my hand and it drops because the weight of the lens is, is uh, so heavy that the front yeah. line element will actually extend out as I'm walking along. Yeah, this ring right here, this ring right here is that tension yeah. ring that Steve yep. is talking about. It's and, got a lot yeah. Of yeah. Oh, mine, the Sony does not. It's either, it just moves from smooth to tight. Uh, well, so, let's see. My Canon, I think, does that too, but it, it gets to a point but, where it's totally locked. Like, you can't move it at all. Oh, yeah. No, I can. I mean, I guess it, it would. Let's see. The dreaded lens creep. No, it's tight enough that it's not going to, but you could still zoom it. But sometimes I feel like a weakling and I have to move it back to the smooth where it's much easier to zoom. Well, so. <laughs> look at these guns. Wait, yeah, you can't you, see them. They're huge. They're off screen. You said we and I was going to run with that, but I decided <laughs> we've been together for a few days now, so I'll, I'll shut up. Yeah. <laughs> Um, hey, I think a new chat in the, in the chat, rocket league is the best Fortnite is boring. Now. I think that's Oliver Henry's friend. Hi, Oliver. How are you doing? I hope you're doing well. Uh, I wanted to mention these. <laughs> um, that's, that's, that's you, username. I thought you were reading a comment. But that, you know, it's, a, it's a very descriptive username, Oliver. I'm going to make the assumption. Um, I I've got the only because Rocket League gives me motion sickness. <laughs> <laughs> I've never tried it. I don't know. Very good. Uh, so. And I can't play that. Fortnite anymore because it's not allowed on Apple because Epic and Apple are in a big fight. So. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. I've got the drone floats back out because headed to Alaska, I'm going to be flying the drone. I, I noticed that part of it was broken, not the drone, but the connection for this. So this is coming along. And I just want to, you know, it's kind of shout out to this product. There's two really nice things about it. One is if you crash your drone into the water, while it might not actually save the drone, it's going to float enough that you're going to be able to retrieve it. I, I would feel horrible if I ended up leaving my drone at the bottom of some pristine bay in a national park or just at the edge of the national parks, you're actually not allowed to fly in national parks, but you're allowed to fly in the water because that's not technically in the park. Um, and if I crashed into that and left behind this pile of electronics and lithium ion battery, I would, I would feel horrible. So I know when I'm flying with these that I will be able to at least retrieve the drone, even if it ends up upside down and floating with these in the top. Also, though, Steve, what do you remember that's really nice about these? Hmm. <laughs> no, it's it's. Uh, I know there's something, but man, that you're probably going back at least a couple of years, and I don't remember anything from two years ago. <laughs> oh yeah, hey, mate. I was I was I was Toby's eminent drone catcher on the last uh, Kodiak trip. So, and that was nice. I, I didn't have to worry about my fingers getting lopped off each time. That's right. That's right. And so um, I don't know if Timmy's watching, <laughs> but since you're not coming along on this trip, uh, Steve, it's going to be Timmy's job to catch. And they really make a nice catching handle uh, because yeah, you are, you're far away from the props and they're solid to grab. I think David McKay's emotional intelligence is starting to rub off on you a little bit. Since you're not coming along on this trip, Steve, this is Tanya, just so you know, in the audience, I have been begging to get on this trip for two years. And <laughs> I've been sidestepped every single step of the way. Uh, and I'm not going on this trip. I'm a little sad about it. And Timmy, I'm sorry, but uh, Megan's going to have to think that I still don't exist anymore. Or at least not on a tour. I've met Megan many times, but uh, not we've never been on a tour together. Well, I'm just going to put this out there. I would not complain to go on any of the trips. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll be a drone catcher. Noted. <laughs> okay. good. Noted. Good point. Good point. Good world problems. Uh, camera world instructor problems. For sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. All right, let's let's uh, jump in um, to a part of the show we really enjoy, and that is reviewing your images. And we've got a fair number today. And as I said, we have a hard out. So we are going to um, just jump right in. 
and uh, start talking about these images. First up, Pam Case has got this really nice detailed shot of a friendly pelican. Your friendly neighborhood pelican. Your friendly neighborhood pelican. I tell you what, something that I think might help us to kind of uh, keep this uh, a little bit tighter today um, is maybe suggesting one or two things that we'd, we'd change and then moving on from there. Okay. Um, and I'll say, I'll go first here with this one is uh, this great shot. I love kind of rule of thirds idea. Uh, Pelican is towards that top left, might even kind of come in a little bit more, um, gives it space to look into. But this bright dock and especially that big cleat in shadow just keep pulling my eye into the background. Yeah. Uh, I was, uh, along those lines, I was going to say I would darken the dock down a bit. And then I would actually paint on the pelican some uh, vibrance and saturation. I would really make that pelican's colors pop because it's the, the head especially is like the identical color of the dock. So you want to create some, some contrast between those or take the saturation down on the dock. But I think there's a lot of room to brighten things up. In yeah, good point. Yeah, and there's some beautiful yeah. colors in the beak. Yeah. You can mm -hmm. just really play up, I think. And the eye. Yep. Totally. Yep. So I just did a select subject because I was curious how well it would select this pelican. And, and it did a very, very good job. We do Command J now. We can see the pelican on its own layer, just how well it did. And then I wonder if we uh, reverse that selection and then just kind of lop off this side over here. So we don't have any of that water and we say content aware fill. How well will it do with the dock and replacing, am I on the wrong layer? Hang on. Yeah. Was yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, edit content aware fill. I know I just said we were gonna speed through these, but I'm curious to see. Select a bunch of the water, not the bird. Almost guaranteed you'll still have to come in and clone this Yeah. afterwards, but. I'd be shocked if it's, well, I mean, if you're just selecting the water, it might be okay, but. Let's see. In I the meantime, little bit of bird. I would like to say, Pam, this is super sharp. And the position of bird is a fantastic moment. So the background is not, like the background is what it was. So yeah, you can fix that. Um, but otherwise this is really well taken. You know what's great about the background is you have that, that uh, cleat back there, that tie off cleat, you know, to show that it is a, a dock. Yeah. Oh, wow. That worked mm -hmm. a lot better than I thought it would, actually. Yeah, I, I'd say so, too. I mean, there's definitely yeah. a separation of texture. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you, I mean, you you did that so quickly. I think if you took some time and really told it what to select from, you could mm -hmm. be heavier on those, you know, bigger waves that are in the background, and it would uh, look more natural. But, yeah. The bonus to this with select subject is that, the stuff that you would want to refine, you don't have to change. Like those feathers on the, the crown of the head, like yeah. you're not going to mess with that. So the select subject was really fantastic for this because it's mostly going to work on that beak and the yeah. solid edge. So yeah, yeah, it did well. It did well. Save that, uh, Pam. If you want the fixed one back, send me a few bucks and we'll go from there. <laughs> Just kidding. All right, we've got uh, Roger Hunt sent along uh, straight out of camera and then his fixed slashed edited shot. Uh, I know he flipped that for my, for me. Yep. <laughs> yep. Oops, hold on, hold on, sorry. There you go. I like it. It's really it. nice. Yeah. yeah. Great. Yep. Good yep. choice, Robert, uh, Roger, on uh, flipping it. And I, I love the edits. I love the, the um, shutter speed, all the detail, the little drops of water and everything. I, you know, I'm a little torn about this because I surf and I you know, grew up in Santa Cruz. I have a lot of buddies who surf all the time. Yeah, I don't know if I, I would consider cloning out the leash. Um, you know, it's, it's part of surfing. So anybody that knows surfing knows that you got to wear a leash. But mm -hmm. 
uh, it could throw you know more novice people off that that don't know what they're looking at. So, or if it just yeah. changed colors, it would work for me. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. So I'm gonna just kind of come in and brush on it real quick, and it, it's just because it's that very bright neon color. Yeah. Um, you know, just kind of let's lower its saturation. You just take it into Photoshop and change that color to black or even or white yeah. or gray or yeah. something. I don't know why I'm not getting any result. Oh, there we go. So lower its saturation a little bit, and we could even do a, a color mask to limit it. But I think that's a great suggestion. Um, otherwise, very nice. Yeah. Nice job, Roger. Yeah. Great work. Sue Stevens, who's trying to stay cool in Las Vegas right now, has this Red Springs edit shot. Cute. Very cute. A lot of uh, great detail on the bird here. Love how sharp this is on the eye and the back. The only thing pulling me away is the little bit of those hotter spots here and then especially down below on the rock. Yeah, this looks like just an unfortunate time of day light. And mm -hmm. since she has the head so sharp, I wonder if you wouldn't just want to crop in and do kind of a head and shoulders hmm. view of the bird. That would be an easier way. Just and maybe come up. you can work on pulling down the highlights and might get rid of some of the stick there in the background when it's mm -hmm. the edit, but I think I the angles could fix that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. I like the I like the feathers. I love seeing how they come down and the texture that's in them. It's a really clear shot. It, initially, when you first put it up on the screen, in, instantly I was like, oh, this has to be black and white. There's just way too much... Um, similarity between the background colors and the warmer colors within the bird. But I don't want to lose the color of the bird either. So maybe I would um, isolate the background and bring saturation down and darken it a bit, and just make that mm -hmm. pop a little bit more. I like that pop right there. You've yeah, I do too. Taken out because the rock, the second rock became a visual element that was competing with the bird in the original crop. Low turned way down, but this would be another great one for in Photoshop and select subject because it's going to do such a great job of, of nailing this bird and the edges of it are so sharp and clean. Um, so and then I really probably use a, a second brush just on the rock and really tone those highlights down. Uh, get yeah. rid of all. I mean, it is it's very hot. So yeah. it, just, you know, it looks to me like it uh, that Sue you might have. It looks like you've already worked at it some, and we're at a point where at least with this JPEG, um, it's blown out. We have, we just, I don't know if it's that spike. I don't see anything right up against the edge, but it's clearly just um, a little overexposed there. And if nice. she wants to fix that, she really could clone the piece of the rock that is exposed well, um, but then switch the clone stamp tool to darken mode. And uh, yeah. be able to retain some of the original texture, but just darken the stone where it's overexposed. Yeah, that's great. a great suggestion. Great suggestion. Yep. Thank you, Tanya. All right, we're going to move on. Uh, Teresa Rice has Golden Fog. Man, Ooh. that's killer. Yeah. This, this, this is very, very nice. If you composited a giant full moon on the left side, you could call this <laughs> Peter Lick image. Uh-huh, <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> um, there's a lot to love here. The only thing I thought, I, I looked at these all um, a little bit earlier today, and with this one, I wondered, and Teresa, I don't know if you have other, I, I'd love to see just a tiny bit more beach. We come down here and it gets a little tight on this for me. And when I look up here, I feel like at a certain point, we could we could have come in somewhere around here. So it could have, it could have come down a little bit and not... Um, um, yeah, and not not included so much up above the sky, but a little bit more beach. I don't know. Do you guys have an opinion about that or anything else you want to comment on this picture? To me, it looks a bit hazy. Mm -hmm. I would definitely apply some dehaze, not overdo it, because some of the haze, I mean, some of the haze uh, is, is part of what's going on here. But yeah. I think that can be toned down a little bit by using the dehaze tool. Uh, and then in the lower right, 
I don't know. Maybe maybe you made it get a little bit more of a silhouette in order to compensate for some of the uh, darker, less hazed, clearer subject matter that's in that lower right that's kind of popping out, but it really doesn't have it doesn't pertain to anything within the story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So just just kind of tie that all together, and it, it'll take a little bit of work, but. Um, I didn't notice it at first, but then when I did notice it, it kept pulling my eye away from the great stuff in the in the photo. Yeah, and and I would make it pop a little bit more. You can you can uh, add some more salt to this dish. Yeah, a little more texture, a little more clarity. Uh, no, a little and more maybe, vibrance and saturation. A little more vibrance and saturation. Yeah, and uh, maybe play around with the uh, white balance a little bit. I, I would mm -hmm. just really. You can exaggerate this one a bit, you know? It's, well. Not that far. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I've come up plus 11, and yeah. I think it still looks, I think it still looks lovely and natural. It's yeah. a beautiful shot, Teresa. Yep, yep. And I saw Roy in chat uh, suggest maybe you could try a little content fill aware if you wanted to bring in a little bit more beach down there, which certainly could be possible too. Yeah. Nice, thanks Teresa. Becky Miller's got her leap of faith from our time working with animals in Montana on that recent Moab trip a month or so ago. Something's wrong with this picture. Like it's, I mean, I, I think with the file transfer or something, look at, look at in the background up against the mountain there. And then yeah. Yeah. the edges of the lion are completely pixelated. Yeah, uh, there's something yeah. funny. And, right. and I don't know Becky's Becky's a great photographer, and she's made awesome improvements over the years. I don't think the file came over the way that it was intended to here. Yeah, I think you're right. I I had noticed the line around the uh, mountain lion. I didn't. I hadn't noticed that yet in the background. Yeah, it's um. I don't know. I I kind of think maybe we should one off Becky and and have this resubmitted. Yeah, I, I guess talk about this one. I think that's a good suggestion. All right, Becky, I'll reach out to you if you're not already watching. All right, let's move on. Ursula's got mother and baby. Hmm. Hmm. I, I think she posted about this a few weeks ago. What a cool thing to experience. Yeah. They're out on a boat and hear the mom and the baby are just leaving. I mean, they're right there. Yeah, that's right there. unbelievable. Um, and that's kind of why I went silent there because the initial impact when I figured out what was going on and it, it took a split second was holy cow. You, you mm -hmm. got to fix that. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. no, I, that's cool. Better. Look, there's, so it, it's a pretty significant crop from a larger, uh, I angle. Like one off in the distance too, including that yeah. one. Really? That's all. Well, I don't know. Let's see with it. Um, you got odd numbers. You got rule of thirds down on the bottom. You've got, I, I don't know. I like that. Mm. It, it gives some scale and perspective and you feel like you're the other one. You, you just, you don't know where in the ocean you are or what's going on in this. You kind of feel like you're, you're right there on the boat with her. Mm -hmm. You make some good arguments, but I don't, I don't know. I can see why she cropped it out because I, I feel like it, 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 it does do those things you say. But the fact that it's just kind of a headless dolphin, bodies, you know, heads gone, no contact. We can fix that. Let's Photoshop Toby's head onto that dolphin. <laughs> <laughs> That's Nick Sharple's job. Is he watching? He, he, he loves doing that stuff. Um, I think there so. are two stories here, but with her crop, we have a really intimate moment between the pair. Yeah. And I do really like that a lot. Mm -hmm. And I well, don't. Uh, I we're kind of lost in the ocean because I feel like I don't want to think I'm on a boat. I want to feel like yeah, closer to them than that. But and actually, with this crop, you came in tighter than it was originally submitted. Yeah. You're still at 2009 on the long edge. So, I mean, for yeah. posting to social media and stuff, it's fine. Yeah, uh, this, this is awesome because it, there's less whitewash. So it's easier to just pick out the detail of the dolphins without getting lost in all the whitewash. Yeah, I think so. And I think it might be worth it to, to work a little bit and take the rest of that splash out. So it really is kind of more of an open ocean feeling um, and have them coming out there. Uh, then, you know, again, this is your D&G. This bright area here 
Tanya, you suggested the kind of cloning earlier. This probably would work yeah. here and here as well to clone in just a little bit to reduce some of that. Um, but otherwise, I think it's really, really cool. I also might just tilt the crop a tiny bit to see if their nose is going up felt a little more mm -hmm. balanced. Yeah. Uh -huh. to, to get their noses going up a little bit more? Yeah. I have to do that sometimes with, with newborns. Like they, they want to lay flat, but I want to make it look like they're kind of leaning upwards. So I just, I just changed the crop because you can't change their position. Yeah. I broke my old iMac asking it to make an enhanced version. Here we go. <laughs> um, so we're now working with using the enhanced version. We're working with a 4,000 by 2,500 mm -hmm. uh, image, and we should be able to uh, get in a little bit tighter and, Decent detail, starting to get a little bit noisy, but okay, let's try that, uh, bringing their noses up just a bit. Yeah, maybe even a little bit more. Yeah, I would go, I would go quite a bit. I'm, I'm curious to see what it looked like flip too. Really? Mm -hmm. Just because mm -hmm. the, the eyes, like it'll, it, it creates that um, visual tennis match where you're kind of darting back and forth. Yeah, probably not. No. It could work. I mean, yep. it could work. Right. I, I just, I didn't, I don't know, it, you know, cause it's looking off to that lower right side, which in a, in a, um, in the framework of a photograph, that's not a really strong place. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the upper right third is extremely visually strong and that's where you've got the blowhole of the dolphin. And so I find myself concentrated more on that than kind of the eyes and the relationship between the baby. So that's why I was saying to flip it. But gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. All right, Ursula, I think you've given you some good ideas though. And then Roy had another one I want to throw in there of um, getting the water, desaturating the water a little bit as well and making them stand out just that much with their kind of blue gray color. Cool. Thank I, I you. Hope I have dreams about dolphin, baby dolphins tonight now. This is such a I know. picture. Gosh. I want to see some baby dolphins. I know. All right, Brian Scanlon's got uh, Surrender. Ooh. Damn. Good title. Yeah. 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 This is interesting. Um, there's so much of this tree up here, and it's kind of the similar idea what I talk about with the sky. I feel like at a certain point, it stops telling um, a part of the story. And it's repetition. Can I come in a little bit from that? Just kind of splitting that difference so that the 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 really crookedness and the kind of decay of the house becomes a little bit more of the story. Does that so make sense? Hit your uh, J key. Oh, okay. Did. There's, yeah. uh, there's data everywhere. I was afraid yeah. that we were losing some stuff in the blacks and just look kind of flat, but. It's dark in there, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, Interesting. So this is a DNG from Brian. Uh, he's made just a few edits to this. Uh, one is Blacks Up 76 and to Haze 23. Interesting. Let me bring shadows up a little bit more. Boost up the um, exposure only just so I can get a better sense of what's, what's going on here. Yeah. So I was just going to kind of say that. I feel like his title pulls this in for me, but without mm -hmm. that my initial reaction was kind of trying to figure out what's going on, especially because it feels like that building is, it's such a strange slant. That's what it is. Yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's, and that's, I think, I think that's part of the story. The exactly. fact that there, but it's, it, it's hard to, I don't, I don't feel like we have enough of it. Um, yeah. With, if he had not titled this, I would have been, confused yeah. and then when i heard the title it kind of all pulled it together for me so yeah. it but it it has it lends itself to some mystery that i like mm -hmm. yeah and i don't think it should stay brighter i just wanted to try and see sure. <coughs> through an increased exposure if i could get a better sense of what's happening here yeah <coughs> yeah yeah, I, I like the idea, but I need, I, I want to see kind of either the roof line of this house a bit or or maybe where it connects to the ground to have kind of some sense um, of this. 
I, I think I maybe go even darker on this picture. I like just make it look really eerie. Just really? yeah, I think the, the highlights are definitely in the brighter areas. The highlights are just too hot for me. So I, you know, having this that, that to me looks better. You see more detail and stuff, but also yeah. you're just not blinded by the the brights that were coming out before. Yeah. yeah. Cool. All right. And I went to a square crop at the end. I saw Roger had uh, suggested that. And I, I think the Actually, square crop can work nicely here. Yeah. For this picture, I usually, I'm, I'm not into square crops at all, but for the right photographs, it can uh, really inc uh, improve the story. And I think I like it on this one. Yeah. All right. We're going to move on. Mike has uh, the St. John's Bridge in Portland, Oregon. There the J key off. Nice. Like starbursts on the lights. Um, we, we talk about this from time to time on the show, and I think this really nicely illustrates it. Uh, I believe, Mike, you waited purposefully for a car to crest that hill and capture the shot right at the moment that it's coming up over the hill. I believe that's what those, those distant lights are. And I think that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. But I also would be interested to see uh, this shot completely vehicle less or, or clear all the way through because I feel like we have such a nice path for us to follow off through those really pleasing arches. What do you think? You guys like the car? Um, I, I don't mind the car. I, um, I love the shot. I would definitely take it into Photoshop, Mike, and I would spend time getting rid of the 30 mile per hour sign and mm -hmm. the back of the sign opposite it on the left side, as well as the, the yellow or um, lighter posts that are right below it on the on the bridge itself. Um, because, you know, once once those are gone, they're no longer a distraction and you can focus on the car coming coming through. And I think it's it's uh, it's cooler than I would like. So I would warm up the picture. Mm -hmm. uh, and I see John put in the comments about taking out that extra street light. I actually think I would add one to the other side. Clone it over there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that, yeah. But yeah. I, that's, that's that's uneven, other... I would just add instead of subtract. Yeah. That's the other thing I want to, uh, that, that bothers me just a little. It is so close to perfectly symmetrical, but not quite. Yeah. Um, and so I want it to be a little closer. I went through the overlays of the crop tool until we got to the small grid just to kind of see just a little bit of a lean. And yes, one pole over here that it feels like the other one should be just right here. Yeah, um, it's probably and, right there. And, um, and, and the primary reason I said take that sign out started with the 30 mile per hour sign on the right is because it's right on the edge of the frame. So either either include it or just clip it out, and that's actually yeah. the very easy thing to take out. The one out, ooh, I like it in black and white. Yeah, I know. I thought that might be nice. That's awesome. I, I for some reason my head didn't even go there with this one, but that was a great call. Great call. It starts to look so nice and crispy that I think it really. Can and I know what you're saying about wanting it to be symmetrical because I felt like that at first too, but he really can't achieve that just based on the road itself. Like the way one has the two lanes, it does look like we kind of, I don't know, we sort of have that extra lane on the side, but the car would never be in the center of the road if you kept that. So- Okay, good point, good point. Mind. Like, I think it works because it's real, mm -hmm. but- mm -hmm. Good points. All right, nice Mike. I think we've given you some good suggestions. We're going to move on. Oh, you got two this week. We're only, we only got time for one from each. So we're going to skip that for now. Chris Bartel has uh, this fern fiddlehead. Let's start though. Here is uh, what she initially captured. And hmm. this little piece over here on the right hand side is what she zoomed in on and edited. Hey, can uh, you Tanya? zoom in the other one? Can you zoom ahead. into the other one? I just want to see if the frond is sharp. So the other, the left branch. Right? The left branch. I don't know if it's a branch, but I wanted to see if the curls were sharper all the way down. Maybe not. A little softer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You got a fly on there. Or you got a little fly <laughs> on there too. 
Yeah, a little, a little sharper. So you, you're noticing that we get some fall off here. Yes. And how does that make you feel, Tanya? That would be a problem for me if this was my shot. But it's not, it doesn't kill it. But I would just want to either crop in farther so that's not there or see if I could get that detail back in like a Topaz software mm -hmm. um, or just shoot a little bit farther back and you should be able to get that um, mm -hmm. if you still can photograph it again. Cause I do think this is cool. And this, the stem or branch that's right behind it in the background, that's real bright underneath. Yeah. I would want to take that distraction away. And my last thing is that I actually think this might be really good in black and white. <laughs> yeah. I what what instantly jumps out at me at black and white is just the real fuzziness of these. As soon yeah. as you lose the green, you see that texture, and that's neat. And I think yep. that maybe we can pull down some of the highlights and get a little more clarity in that top bunch, which ends up being the focal point. So, mm -hmm. but this is. I, I'm a big fan of ferns, so I do really love this. Mm -hmm. I just I brought shadows way down. Uh, what What do you think about you know being a little more heavy handed with the background and kind of taking it down almost all black, so it becomes just this frond? I, I would. I think that'd be fantastic. Yeah, I like that too. I mean, it really helps it to. It already stood out with the depth of field, but now it really pops. Uh, it feels much more three-dimensional now. Like you could literally just kind of reach out and touch that thing. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Nice shot, Chris. And I think uh, we offered some some ideas there. All right. We've got Jeremy Lavender's Eagle Glacier. Oh, when you said that I started looking for an eagle, I was like, I don't see it. <laughs> <laughs> Name of the glacier, I'm assuming. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as I said, I, I flipped through these earlier today and it, it took me a moment and I don't know if you've seen it yet or not, but there is water at the bottom yeah. of this frame. And I was just thinking about whether or not to leave that. Yeah, when I when I looked at it, I thought it doesn't it doesn't really do anything for me. I think we can start in those green or those dark trees, that dark tree line somewhere in there. I don't I don't miss them. I don't miss the water. Nope. Yeah, no, I I don't either. Um, I yeah, I, I like it better like this. Yeah, it really anchors it at the bottom rather than diving into another part of the story. Basically, you know, when you yeah. when it goes to light again, and it's and we're looking at it on a background that's very similar to the color of the water. So even if you yeah. change it, um, I think. Uh, I just like the way it's anchored in, in darks down at the bottom now, like this. And and other than that, Jeremy, I think you did a great job with the edit. I love mm -hmm. this really wide uh, crop that he chose. And mm -hmm. this guy just lives, he's just got the greatest backyard on the planet where he is. <laughs> every, every one of his shots are just so cool. It's very nice. The, uh, the only thing that I'm wondering about a little bit is it feels like maybe a little bit of dehaze was used. And so we have just this lightning in the valley between the first ridge and the start of those mountains. I might bring this back down a bit. I mean, in one hand, it helps to separate. So I'd only do it a little bit, but it feels like it's a little bit brighter in there than, than I want, especially since it does seem to fade back away as you climb the mountain. Yeah. And, and maybe add just a tiny touch of contrast up to these cliffs uh, and maybe brighten them a little bit to have them stand out because I think they are a really strong part of this story. We have these epic mountains, but then these are gigantic cliffs that are look nearly vertical. And well, that would be a great place to spend some time bringing out detail and really kind of making the viewer plant themselves right there because that's the glacier coming down through the mountains. And I think some people could kind of miss that. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. All right. Uh, we're going to move on to our last shot. Deb Whirling's got pretty in pink too. Wow. Mm. Yeah. So this will ruin the title, but I kind of would like to see this in black and white. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> 
And I think you'd have to really play with the contrast, but I think this works well either way, at least. Yeah, it does work either way. I, I did like it better in pink personally. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that now that I see it this way, but I just thought it had such impressive light that it might be a really good high contrast black and white, but I do like the pink. And yeah, I the, only, the only reason I say that though is, is uh, I mean, it looks beautiful either way, but when it's pink, I have a very easy time understanding what it is and what's going on here. When it's black and white, I'm kind of like, what am I looking at? Is this the back of a swan or is this a flower or what, what's going on here? I think that's a good point. I had that. I had that thought. I almost thought it looked like it could be an orange, maybe, or something when it went black and white. I did love the detail that you started to see in those little speckles, black and white. But I think it needs to stay color so we know it's a uh, some type of flower. You know, I don't have a lot to add to this in terms of constructive mm -hmm. criticism, but I want to compliment Deb on the the nature of the fall off that she's done with the editing, where it goes, it kind of fades to black towards the bottom. It's, mm -hmm. it's extreme, but it's, this is going to just sound crazy. It's extreme, but it's subtle. Like it, it goes to black very quickly, but it doesn't, there's no line. And you got these little parts of the pedal that are sort of trailing down and stuff. And it just looks to me, it just looks absolutely stunning. Yeah. It doesn't look artificial. I think is what you're trying yeah. to say. I mean, it, it. I yeah. see that a lot when people are kind of doing their edits and they're they're fading something down into a black background and it, it can have these extreme um, where it should be faded and look natural and it can just look extreme and, and sudden. And she, in my opinion, she totally nailed it here. I think it's an absolutely gorgeous shot. Yeah. Uh, we um, Deb wants to know if, she, if we think it's good for uh, uh, the PPA competition, for IPA. It's funny, I, my mind was kind of going there. I wasn't gonna talk about it, but I was thinking to myself, I wonder if this would be a competition. You know, flowers in competition, Deb, are extremely difficult to merit because there are a ton of amazing floral shots that are entered every year. And I've, I've just noticed that. It's kind of like portrait. Um, you know, portrait has its own whole category but there are so many of them and I've seen judges be really hard on them. And a lot of it though, is that, that I, I, I don't really know how to judge a floral um, picture like this. They do. So, you know, if they were able to, sometimes they talk about it. If the photo is challenged, I think it would be, I don't know. I don't know who you talk to about this. Maybe Jeff Dachowski run it by him. Or maybe if you feel like it's a risk, wait again for districts. Yeah, that's a good point. That's District is always a great place to try something out. Um, but for the international photo competition, you really want to have it kind of nailed down on your floor. Yep. This is a great yep. perspective, though. I love this shot. So, yeah. I, I would add, I think, for it to do well um, at the international level is I'd love maybe to see it sprinkled with a little bit of water. And I think I'd love to see a little bit more depth, a little sharpness, uh, uh off in the distance of the flower petals of the peony. You know, who, my who uh, is doing tons of floral shots these days is Susan Michael. Yes. I don't know whether we've had her on this show before, but many of you in the whole McKay and photo enthusiast network world might know her. She was a past president of PPA and she served as a um, instructor with us, you know, from time to time. And boy, is she talented when it comes to floral photography. She's been working on a book, I believe recently. And she, yep. uh, if you get a chance to check out her Instagram page, uh, go to it for some inspiration on flower photography that, that would probably um, answer some questions in terms of how you do it well. Yep. Yep. All good suggestions. Okay, everybody, thanks so much for that. We're going to come back to us. Um, and then I'm going to briefly show uh, something. I One of the headlines I put in the show, I didn't tease it at the beginning, but I put it in the show was, I was wrong. So I want to talk about that. But let's jump over to the discussion of uh, changing gears greatly here. Gear. The Nikon retro camera. We talked about it. Here are some pictures of it. So we'll come back to this. Here are some early pictures. Steve, you love retro. How does this look? 
looks retro and cool to me, man. And it's and it looks film like, which I always love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I I love this. This is a little teeny yeah. LCD that's going to give you the f-stop. Yeah, it um, looks like a uh, like a window. Yep, yep. Very very cool. Very well done. Here are a few more pictures. And so here's the disappointment. It is going to be APS-C. Now I'm not. I love APS-C. I think APS-C is a great travel um, spot. It's a, it's great for many many people as an all around camera. But look what they have pictured here, and this is Nikon's problem right now. Two things. They have very, very few APS-C lenses, and the ones they do are going to look dumb on this camera. <laughs> now, that might be vain. <laughs> that might be vain, but... Uh, we've talked about this before on this show, and for those who don't know, like, I think it's fine to have a critical eye for aesthetics. We're photographers. Yeah. I, I, mean, I didn't have a critical eye for aesthetics. What am I doing as a photographer? And that does translate to the equipment. And if I'm going to spend a lot of money on a piece of equipment and retro is part of the design, then yeah, I'd like a lens that sort of ties into that whole look and feel. Uh, that's where Fuji just nails it. You know, Fuji comes out with these retro sort of styled uh, cameras and then they've got a silver lens option and a black lens option and, it looks so cool. So I, I think you're absolutely right on the money with that. And, you know, just strap on this, yeah. this cheaper plastic lens that just doesn't look like it fits the, the body at all. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> what, what is the, what is the film? Oh, sorry, Tiny, go ahead. I just said they are so disappointing looking. Like I was totally into it until you pulled back and showed the lenses. And I was like, Oh, <laughs> Like that lens, whatever that lens is right there, it's hard for me to see. It doesn't look doesn't look too bad. The other one, mm -hmm. uh, which looked more like a kit lens, yeah. A lot no, that's, that's, a, that's like their a prime. Actually. That's their that's their one hundred five prime. Yeah, I was gonna say that. Now that I look at it, it looks like more of a premium lens, but it just doesn't fit the the overall no. style no. of of what you're going for here. Style. But there's there's nothing to stop you from grabbing the Z adapter. That's this black ring right here and throwing on some old Nikon lenses and walking around with a modern camera with older lenses. Now, most of those, almost all of those lenses aren't going to autofocus. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's something. And, and, you know, Brian in chat just joined us. He's a Fu Fuji shooter. He's got uh, the medium format and their, um, you know, XT line, um, their, their APS-C. And that's what Fuji has done so well that you said, Steve, so I'm not going to repeat all of that. But Nikon has some big catching up to do if they want this camera to actually do well. And part of that big catching up to do, well, two parts. One is make APS-C lenses so that you're not having to buy big, heavy lenses that kind of negates the idea of buying into APS-C. And two, make at least some of these lenses match the look of the body. Yeah, see, what I wish they would do is come out with two versions of their higher-end full-frame stuff. You know, um, they don't have to restock. Come out with a style. That's what I just love. I love the style of Fuji. I, I think that's ultimately what it comes down to. I wish more camera companies would come out with style, style products like what Fuji and Olympus have done. Uh, but, you know, it can get really heavy with some of these bigger ones, too. So I, yeah. I get that. Yeah. Uh, I got a question, though. It looks like, well, first off, we have this little, you know, flip out film winding yeah. dial. It's got an exposure indicator on it. We also are an exposure compensation. It's even got that mark. What the heck does this dial do? Uh, yeah, looks that looks like it's exposure compensation right there. Mm -hmm. um and mm -hmm. what's the uh what's the winder for it's not it's not shooting is this, a, I this really is love a, that it has a winder i love it yeah i do too <laughs> and it's digital right does it does it just does it just make the noise it just makes the little noise for you and makes you happy yeah i mean if it's just kind of like on there but it it it's just hoke like it doesn't serve any kind of purpose then that that's a little mm -hmm. to me. i mean Mm -hmm. I like the look of it, but what purpose could it serve though? If it's an actual, actually functioning winder, I can't imagine that it serves a purpose. Yeah, I mean, it could adjust. I don't know. Your well, you you've got your shutter speed adjustment there. Maybe it could adjust your ISO or something. 
Do well, you, I'm not doing hold, hold, it, especially since Toby sold this to me as you could put an inferior lens on it to look, make it look cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm worried that we're not actually looking at the real thing. I, I'm worried that this is partially a mock-up because if we look here, these actually, we got some actual pictures. This right-hand side is not the same as what we have on the right-hand side over here. No, are we looking at the F series, their actual film lens, uh, a camera body? Maybe, maybe. And this, these are actual, I think, from their FC that's coming. Yeah, so we're we're probably looking at their their modern film camera that uh, so, okay. that uh, Nikon has. I forget the what they call it. Somebody in the chat will know. But um, I don't know. It's confusing. It's confusing because no we, we you put a film winder on a camera that, that it just doesn't take film. It's Nikon might do it. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Talk about cheapening your product, man. Okay, let's, so let's, let's come in colors. <laughs> yeah, I mean the other the other thing that I think Nikon has is it's a bit of a struggle. Is you, Steve, you saw me working with it uh, in Joshua Tree. I still have the Z5, the the full frame mirrorless from Nikon, which I think is the best budget full frame mirrorless on the market. Awesome. Uh, and so, why would you buy into the AFC uh, if uh, you can get? A full frame for basically the same price and also again they don't have the lenses so look, yeah. look at jason troyer's comment i just saw that <laughs> <laughs> i'll put that on the screen that's, that's great <laughs> <laughs> yeah you, you can't pop your sd card back out until you crank it back <laughs> that's that's a that's a card format winder <laughs> <laughs> oh that's kind of fun all right. Um, the EOS R3 is supposed to be, uh, uh, people have seen it in the wild. It's been used at the G7 Summit. Uh, it looks like 30 megapixels right around there. Uh, okay. And I think that that for a sports and very fast action oriented camera, I think 30 megapixels is a good point. Yep. Uh, we have this wonderful quote that's making the rounds. Uh, I'm a Nikon shooter. Today I've seen the Canon R3 and I've seen the future. I've got over 10,000 pounds worth of Nikon DSLR gear and it's worthless. Wouldn't get more than three pounds, 3,000 pounds trade in for it all now. DSLR is dead. Wow. I mean, uh, I don't know. Has he hold a, held a Sony camera? And I'm not saying that as a Sony shooter uh, because, uh, you know, I don't think Sony is the best of the best, but I think for a few years now, when if you put your hands on the Sony A9 back when it was released, what, in 2018, I think? New York 2018 was that trip. Um, we were like, yeah, this is going to be just fine for everybody who needs a fast action camera. Uh, and now that they have more lenses. But uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm curious to see it as this comes out. But um, all um, the other uh, bits. You know, in addition to being like a, it's got to look cool guy. I'm a big ergonomics guy though too. And that's one of the things with, that I've always loved with my Canon equipment is ergonomically. Now I, I, I have big hands. So, you know, larger camera body, it doesn't bother me at all. I, I know it, it weight and you pack it all up, it gets heavy, but I really like the feel of the, the Canon and you know, the larger cameras in my hand. And it looks like they've, they've done that with this R3 ergonomically. It looks almost identical to an X1D mm -hmm. uh, just yep. a little bit smaller, of course. Yeah. Yeah. It looks quite nice. So there it is. Um, again, though, you know, one of the things that I like about the Sony is that I have a lot of that power in a camera that's still very travel friendly. I yeah. have normal sized hands. But, <laughs> nice <laughs> but um you know a lot of people are going to be putting larger lenses on this camera and i know that is a very valid complaint about the sony is with that smaller body those larger lenses don't balance quite as nicely and and also it's it's a uh, it's a little bit more snug in here in the grip with larger lenses so the r3 looks like it's going to um not have that issue at all and be pretty spectacular yeah so I feel like I need to weigh in on this for a second because I've been accused yes. of 
piano playing fingers. <laughs> I was a pastor's kid, and so any if you have long fingers, then you're doomed to take piano lessons. Oh, is that? I didn't know that. I, I was going to ask, what are piano player fingers? Are those long or short? I would imagine they're long. long. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I actually had a hard time adjusting to my mirrorless Nikon because I like having the bigger, bulkier camera. Um, no. Now that it's kind of readjusted to the smaller camera body. I like it better because I realize that I'm not carrying around all that weight, but I do like the larger camera body. Yeah. Yeah, I've got the, uh, that's actually my, my hands are probably normal size. It's the fingers. I've got Arsenio Hall fingers. These things are just small. <laughs> Arsenio, Arsenio Hall. <laughs> yeah, he got that okay. reference and you're, you're a bit older like me. Yeah, yeah. all right. Okay, let's let's move on. I've seen a couple of questions come in that we want to answer, so I want to make sure we have time for those and still wrap up to um, mind the time. I know, not my cute niece. I wanted to go to this picture. Oh, sorry. Hold on. We have to see a couple of them. Okay. Um, so I said I'm wrong. So for a while now, there have been these nighttime light pollution battling filters out. And I thought, really, what do they do? I don't really... I feel like they just changed the white balance some and um, don't do much more than that. But I finally remembered to bring mine along and test it this weekend. Uh, and I have um, the shots that are the resulting shots. So here is a picture with no filter on. Uh, this is uh, slightly edited. Uh, just just barely you can see the milky way coming up here over the rocks uh this is a 90 second shot so this is was using the star tracker as well so that's i'm going to do a video soon i hope about that star tracker and some other astro stuff because i'm really impressed with that look how sharp these stars are 90 seconds the downside of course though is the landscape is not so sharp but you can posit that now here is a the same shot with the um filter on and let's look at these two pictures side by side they are quite different and notice the amount of stars that that you can see over here that just aren't visible in the brighter light pollution area on the right it's pretty significant yeah it's a big difference but all that said after a lot of editing uh, here's kind of my finished product of this that I think I'll share on Instagram tonight. Um, That's beautiful. I can't, thank you, but I can't quite get it to a color that I like. So I feel like changing the white balance, I'm, I'm stuck in this much cooler tones um, and the much redder Milky Way, uh. which I, I don't know if I like. I've worked at it a lot to try to bring it back into the warmer area. Um, and I can't. So upside downside, uh, it does bring in some more stars in the more light polluted area, but it also, I guess, permanently cools your image and brings out some other colors in the Milky Way that I'm not used to see. So I don't know. I like it. I like those colors, but I it's frustrating that you can't change them if you want to. Yeah. Yeah. Which I mean, honestly, I feel I felt stupid last night for a while. I was like, let me oh, this is the tiff now that it's been into Photoshop and back. But what it's still, it's still I just I I just don't like what happens to it when you just kind of warm it up and I've worked for yeah, both the temp and tint. You messed with the tint too? Yeah. And yep, it's to make your foreground all green, isn't it? Yeah, but I actually don't mind too much because I have a for different foreground to sandwich in. So mm. I, I didn't mind too much. Did you selective color or replacement color in Photoshop? Hmm. I did not try replacement color in Photoshop. Maybe I should talk to you a little bit about that. Um, but I did I did work with HSL and color panel a little bit. I worked with color grading, just kind of playing around with each of those and wasn't loving, you know, not, neither, none of it seemed like a good solution. Hmm. I think this color yeah. palette is lovely, but it's just irritating if it's not what you want. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm I'm curious to see how people respond to it on Instagram because it's very different and it and it's more blue than I've put up in quite a while for stars, but um, but it's intriguing to me. So uh, yeah, it's kind of a fun experiment. 
I'll uh, I'll post up an unforgettable response when you get it up there. Don't worry. Oh, no, good. Oh, good. I look forward to that. <laughs> I'll troll. <laughs> I can't believe you posted this crap. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, real quick, let's pull up a couple of questions that I saw. Where is my folder for questions? Right here. And uh, then we are going to wrap the show up. So, oh, we just have one. Roger wanted to know, does sticking the conversion adapter uh, uh, to use a Canon EF lens on a Canon mirrorless affect the area on the sensor? Basically, you're saying, I think, does it affect kind of what you're projecting onto the sensor or anyway, or does it affect the aperture or autofocus in any way? Um, I can answer that because I've tested the EF lenses on the RF cameras or the R mount cameras. And the basic answer is no. Uh, that's one of the things that Canon has done really, really nicely. Um, that you're using Canon's own adapter. You don't lose autofocus speed. You don't lose any kind of aperture performance. And there is, there is no difference um, really. Yeah. in the real world it's that's it, fine so it's it's great i still think down the road everybody will eventually like to be native because as david carr said a few shows ago the adapter is just one more thing to sometimes forget and leave behind uh, i've done that and then you've got these nice lenses you've got this nice camera but you've got no way to to match them up and it's also just one more seam where dust or moisture could get into your camera but um, those are kind of minor. And honestly, I think they're pretty minor. And overall, it is a great way. Both Nikon and Canon, let's broaden it open. Both of them have their own adapters and they work extremely well with their own lenses and work very well with many third party. But your mileage may vary as you get to kind of the older third party uh, and even all the, some older uh, native lenses as well or EF lenses or uh, DX FX lenses from Nikon. So, yeah. 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 I think that's it. I think we did a good job of keeping a little bit of a tighter ship today. Yeah. That was so. one of the shorter shows we've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> Close to it. Close to it. Um, Steve, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. It was nice to see you virtually after seeing you and smelling you uh, for the last weekend. Um, <laughs> now, Steve always short. does... Uh, this was, you know, occasionally Toby and I get to lead a tour together. And um, I mean, I, I don't say this to, to knock David and Allie and all the other instructors that we have and stuff, but we've been working together for so many years and it's really been a nice compliment to our, our working relationship that David has said, hey, you know what? I trust you guys enough to go ahead and lead a tour. I don't have to be there. And that give, that frees him up to be able to do another tour. And I'm always flattered by that, but I'm always like, then the buck stops with us on that trip. We can't pawn anything off on, on David. Um, well, we do, but you know, <laughs> uh, so anyway, all that to say is, you know, it was just an awesome, awesome tour. I had a great time and I think I'm just on this real high when it comes to tours this year, because we haven't done many of them over the last uh, year, year and a half. And I get home and I'm just like re-energized for photography and for you guys and for everything that, that we do for the community. And um, it's just a real honor. So thanks for an awesome tour. Sure. Yeah, it worked, it worked out well. Thank you, Steve. You can, of course, follow him at Scourge on Instagram. I'm sure he'll be posting some of his uh, shots from Joshua Tree soon. Did one so right before we went online. So go check oh, it out. Yeah. Awesome. I missed that. Great. I'll go look for that. Uh, and Tanya, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate you taking a little time to uh, hang out with us and lend your advice and thoughts. I love um, you. So. Great. Thank yeah. you. You can follow her at tanyawilhelm.artist. Go check out that link and follow it on to. You have to. I know it's three accounts. You like three accounts for one person. <laughs> but seriously, three accounts. They're all worth following. Go check them out. I, I am going to go look up the cicada ones now because I'm excited and then I'll pass them on to my friend on the West Coast who's missing the cicadas and doesn't feel like anybody's done a good job documenting them yet. So, <laughs> Tony, there's an opportunity. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right. In chat room, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. I really appreciate it. Love your comments and questions. And Roy, thanks for being there, uh, managing all everything on the back end. So, um, I, there are no show next week. 
I will not be here. I don't want to say why, because it'll make Steve cry, but I won't be here next week. Uh, I think I will be the week after, so there should be a show before it goes on a little bit of a July break as I do some family travel and a couple more workshops. Great. So, and we get to hear all about the great tour that I wasn't on. <laughs> that, that Tanya and I weren't on. That's right. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. All right, guys. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll see you again.